Please be seated. Lynn and I just returned from Cuba, which had a truly proud, profound effect upon us. Before Cuba, going to Cuba, I read today's readings, especially the gospel, and I didn't see how I would possibly preach on them. There was no real inspiration. My thoughts were elsewhere. When we returned from Cuba, I read them again, and to my surprise, I found that they carried the message that I wanted to share with all of us today. Both the epistle and the gospel reading today, to me, really declare a very simple but very profound message, especially the gospel, which is the clearest New Testament declaration of our responsibilities to develop our God-given talents for our own benefit and for the benefit of others. This is the basic thesis of Adam Smith's most famous book, The Wealth of Nations, the full title of which is An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. <coughs> Matthew's gospel story is also the theme of Adam Smith's lesser known book, but equally important, which is entitled The Theory of Moral Sentiments. This book forms a basis of the ethical and moral principles for the wealth of nations. It is really quite a profound book, and it, it is coming back into popular acceptance today. These two works form the basis of all economics and provide the moral justification for hard work and enlightened self-interest and mutual help and support. These two great works are summarized in today's gospel, the lessons of which are quite harsh. When Jesus says, so take the talent from him and give it to the one with 10 talents. For to all those who have, more will be given and they will have abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him out into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is quite cruel. It is one of the harshest judgments ever expressed in the Bible against seemingly righteous people. But in the Old Test both in the Old Testament and in the New, why does Matthew go to this extreme to portray Jesus as so judgmental and so severe? Why? Because that is life. That is reality. We are given certain talents, and we must develop them for our own good and for the good of others. And we must take risks in doing so. We must put ourselves on the line in order to use our talents fully. Well, this gospel is not a lesson in economics. It is an admonition to the early Christians to keep the faith, just as was stated in the epistle. We were admonished, the early, especially the early Christians, not to hide our talents under a bushel basket, not to bury them in a field. This image appears twice in the Gospels, and Jesus made it very clear that we had to show forth our talents and not hide them from the world. And this, this, this Gospel was written to really encourage the early Christians in that sense. But this is what is happening in Cuba today. The churches are letting their light shine forth, and they are taking the risks, and have been taking the risks, to stand up for their faith and to live the life that a Christian should be able to live in a free society. Karl Marx, however, had a totally different idea. He proposed a system of class warfare to take from those with 10 talents and to give those who had none. When you read Karl Marx, you realize that he did not know basic accounting principles, and the math of his economics simply does not add up to wealth creation, but to wealth destruction. We see that, obviously, in Cuba today, as well as in almost every communist country in the world. However, his basic theory is, is a perverted notion of Robin Hood economics that is quite pervasive around the world, 
and has led to more wars, more class warfare, and more failed nations and failed economies. While Lynn and I just returned from Cuba, this is an example of Karl Marx in action and the lessons of today's gospel. The talents of the Cuban people have been taken away and given to others, but not to the, the poor and the downtrodden, because today they are more poor. They are worse off today than 50 years ago. Unfortunately, not by their own choice, the people of Cuba have been cast out into the darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Cuba is a paradise, a garden of Eden, where the land is truly flowing with milk and honey. The word Cuba means where fertile land is abundant. Yet, Cuba cannot feed its people, and it must import 60 to 70 percent of its food, a good bit of it coming from the United States, despite the embargo. The Cuban economy cannot meet the basic needs of its people, including food, clean water, clothing, and shelter. But this is not a lecture on economics. It is a lecture, it is a, an epistle, it, it is my letter, it's my epistle on the Cuban people. The Cuban people we met were warm and loving and physically embraced us with hugs and kisses as if we were longtime friends and family, even though they were meeting us for the first time. Those in our group who had been to Cuba before were greeted with tears of joy and shed their own tears in response. It was our first visit and will not be our last. Our mission was to assist several churches with a program called Living Waters. We were told by our team leader not to drink the water anywhere. And she was right. It will make you sick. We are so fortunate in our country to have drinkable tap water. We take it for granted. In Cuba, they do not, both in the cities and in the rural areas. In fact, there is a serious cholera outbreak in the province and, pardon, in the province and city of Matanzas due to unclean water. I'll have a sip of clean water. <laughs> Our mission was to install and maintain water treatment systems in the churches so that they could provide clean and drinkable water for their communities. This clean water has become a powerful symbol and resource for their churches and for their people. The impact has been dramatic, both on the health of the people, especially on the children, and on the church communities themselves. The clean water is dispensed daily or thrice weekly, depending on the volume produced and available, <coughs> because it is in limited supply. It is dispensed for free beginning at 8 a.m. and the lines form at 6 a.m. Our team brought down the equipment such as pumps, PVC piping, meters, screws, nuts and bolts, and most importantly, filters. None of these items can be obtained readily in Cuba. The Cuban government allows the import of this equipment for, quote, quote, humanitarian purposes for the churches. In fact, one pump was detained by the customs officials in Havana until one of the church pastors could come and claim it personally for his church and pay an extra fee, of course. Besides the health of the people, the other major impact is on church participation and attendance. Our church group is the St. Charles Presbyterian Church in New Orleans, where Lynn and I were married, <coughs> where she was baptized and raised. It has a Cuban partner, which is the Church of El Fuerte in Veradero. El Fuerte means the fort. And it, the, the city of Veradero is a beautiful but dilapidated city on the Atlantic seacoast. The beaches are glorious, by the way, but we didn't have much of a chance to enjoy them. We just took a brief walk along one of the beaches one evening, and it was just absolutely spectacular. Because of the Living Waters program, El Fuerte has become known as the Water Church. I spoke with one man who had just filled his three-gallon jugs with clean water, which he was carrying on his bicycle. He was so grateful for the water 
and said it is doing so much good for his family. He was a retired ship's pilot, and his salary had been about $30 a month. In Louisiana, a ship's pilot can earn $300,000 to $400,000 a year. He said this water made his grandchildren a lot healthier. We shook hands after quite, a, quite an animated conversation. He spoke fairly good English, because I don't speak Spanish, unfortunately. Uh, we, after we shook hands, he rode off with his th three jugs hanging on his bicycle, and I was the richer by far. He gave me the gift of his gratitude, which I personally did not deserve, but accepted for all those before me who had brought living waters to this church. We were there to help install and, and maintain. Before coming to Cuba, I was asked to preach a sermon on living waters at the main Sunday service in the Matanzas Central Presbyterian Church. This church was celebrating its first anniversary with Living Waters, and it is an oasis in the middle of this cholera epidemic. And people were lined up outside of the church, not so much to hear me, but to get the water. <laughs> My written words were translated beforehand and given to the congregation. My theme was that water and love are essential for life, both physical life and spiritual life. Without either one, we will surely die. Without water, we will die in a few days. Without love, our bodies will also die, and so will our souls. Water and love are critical to our very existence, survival, and spiritual growth. I cited several Old Testament and New Testament references to water as major themes in the Bible virtually from creation to revelations. The Bible really begins with water in creation and ends with water in revelations. Specific examples were Noah and the great flood, and that's after creation because God passed his hands over the waters and all life came forth from the waters. Noah and the great flood, the parting of the Red Sea by Moses, Jesus' baptism by John, the wedding feast at Cana, Jesus and the woman at the well, <coughs> and the water which flows from Jesus' side on the cross. Water is a sign of cleansing, nourishment, and salvation. As the congregation filed out of church, I stood with the pastor, who incidentally was really a wonderful man. Uh, he had spent seven years in Toronto getting a PhD in theology and ministry. And his wife was getting also a, the a PhD in, in uh, church ministry. And he had lived there for seven years with his wife, I think they, they met there or whatnot, but she was, they were going back the day after we were there, and he would spend another month finalizing his thesis and, and then coming back. But it's a sign of what was happening because these people are now, they have the confidence to let them go. The Cuban government has the confidence to let them go, especially church people, because they know they'll come back. And that's, that's a sign of the reawakening and the hope that is, that is going on in Cuba today. Uh, so while I was standing with this pastor, the people would come out and hug me. I mean, I'd never seen these people before, and they would say, I love you, and they'd say it in Spanish, they'd say it in English, they'd repeat it, they'd come back and hug. It was really quite moving, and we weren't giving them money. This wasn't, you know, solicitation on the street. And we were overwhelmed, truly overwhelmed with a sense of gratitude and hope. We were also invited into the homes of several elderly members of the El Puerte Church, who could no longer attend regular services. And by the way, by the way we got there was we got in a horse and buggy carriage to take us there because in these, even in Havana, but especially in the rural communities, 80% of all transportation is horse and buggy. Wagons, everything. I mean, it's, you know, agriculture is not mechanized. Agriculture is horse drawn still to this day. I'd say for a substantial part of it. No one could give me a precise figure. But one of our, one of our guides was a man named Gustavo, he was a retired civil engineer, a terrific guy. Uh, spoke very good English, and we've invited him and his wife to come, come visit us. Uh, and he, as an engineer, could give us facts. He could give us facts, and it was really quite, quite impressive. And he has two children here in the United States and two grandchildren. Uh, and they took us to visit the home of an, uh, one elderly lady who was very elegant and well into her 80s whose familiar name is Nina. 
I don't remember her, her full name, but she was a founder of the El Fuerte Church, uh, which is the water church, many years ago when it was very difficult to do so and almost impossible to even practice Christianity in Cuba. She did not let her, her light hide under a bushel basket. Her home was immaculate and tidy and her gardens lush. Her neighbors helped maintain her house and garden since she is no longer able. And that's what people do there. They really do help each other in a remarkable way. We sat in her small living room, and despite her dementia, she recounted stories of the church and her work. She had been an English teacher and could still speak a few words that we could understand. She recited Psalm 23 from memory in Spanish with the aid of our church guide and sang a hymn in Spanish that was angelic. In turn, our group sang Amazing Grace in English. There were tears in all our eyes. I saw in her my mother, and we all saw the eternal mother. She may not live much longer, but she will live forever in our hearts. We all hope to see her again on our next visit. This was just a typical day, a typical meeting that we had with the people. During our trip, we did not bring up politics once. We were advised not to. But our Cuban friends did so often, but only obliquely. They would say, we like what Fidel did, but that was 50 years ago. He brought social equality, but he failed in politics and economics. We are much poorer now. They all said, they all said this, but they didn't say it with a sense of resignation and failure, they said it with a sense of hope. They said it with a sense of looking forward, that the light will shine again. And our job as Christians and as Americans of all religions is to balance the social issues without killing the goose that laid the golden egg. All nations must make those same choices and judgments about the social, political, and economic issues in order to achieve the balance and harmony for a society progress. Cuba is changing now, slowly, but probably more rapidly in the not too distant future. They all say change is coming. The two dates that they mention most is 1959 with the Cuban Revolution and 1991 when the Soviet Union failed. And they say those are the two most significant dates because since 1991, religion has been allowed to, to come back into the society and they haven't suppressed it again. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church represented almost 80, 90% of the population before the revolution. Uh, the, the hierarchy was, to a certain extent, identified with the Batista regime. So it was suppressed and suppressed severely because of the palaces of the bishops and the cardinal and whatnot. Today, the Roman Catholic Church is about 48% of the people, and the Protestant churches have come on very, very strong. And one of our guides was, um, and sponsors was the, the president of the Council of Churches. All the churches uh, in Cuba can be a member of that church, including, uh, including Jews and Mormons and whatnot. You know, all the churches can be a member, including they've invited the Roman Catholics, but the Roman Catholics do not attend. They're not officially a member, but as, as Dobiko said, who's the president, he said, but they come anyway, okay. so, which is good. So they all say that there is hope for a better day. They all say, we love Americans. We want our governments to work together. There is no embargo between the Cuban people and the American people. And they said, Fidel replaced Jesus. Jesus is now replacing Fidel. And they were a very spiritual people before, but Fidel was a, you know, was a great leader. I mean, he did some remarkable things. But now Jesus is replacing Fidel. There is hope and there is love in Cuba, and that will bring a better day. By doing something practical, as we did, like providing living waters, this clean water will help break the dams of intolerance and wash away the fears to allow our two countries to grow together in the true Christian spirit of love and mutual support. 
That's what the lessons today are about, the epistle and especially the gospel. We also had a wonderful time every evening. The food will, which El Fuerte prepared for us was delicious, and the rum and cigars, plentiful. <laughs> they were terrific. <laughs> so, uh, in fact, on the rooftop, we would go up to the rooftop of the, uh, the, 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 house, the housing where we stayed in the church, and the nine of us would sit around and drink a bottle of rum and smoke cigars, or drink two bottles of of rum and smoke cigars. We had, a, we had a wonderful time. And we would recount the events of the day and, and what we could do to, you know, some of it was technical, how to install and whatnot. Uh, and Lynn and her sister-in-law cooked a meal for the El Fuerte Church one time, one, one, one day, one midday. Uh, and it was fantastic. I mean, it was one of the best meals. I, I mean, it was jambalaya and gumbo. <laughs> And they brought down the ingredients, and it was very spicy and very tasty and whatnot. And the Cuban people have no spices. They have some peppers, but they don't have spices. They don't have Tabasco sauce. They don't have uh, saturies. They don't have, you know, they don't have real spices. So this was a shock to them. Some of them loved it. They thought, oh, this is the best thing I've ever had. Some of them said, ooh, ooh, caliente, caliente. <laughs> but it was really quite, quite exciting. And they did love it, and several of them said, no one has ever prepared a meal for us. So I thought that was a great, a great compliment. And of course, because that's what the Eucharist is. The Eucharist is a meal. So the Cuban people, and this, is what, this leads up to something that Lynn said, the Cuban people may be poor, but they are rich in spirit and, in a, and rich in a joy of living that cannot be suppressed and will again blossom. We left Cuba with far more than we brought there. We brought 1,100 pounds of equipment, medicines, candy, whatever we could, could bring. So as Lynn said, they have so little, little, but they gave us everything, which they truly did. They opened up their houses, their hearts, their homes, their churches, everything. One day, they will have their 10 talents multiplied many, many times over and returned to them. And I hope we will all be a part of it. Amen.